bees help produce nutritious and delicious foods that feed us. These incredible creatures feed our world by pollinating most flowering plants. These plants, in turn, are feeding insects, birds, mammals, countless other creatures. Rather than thinking of bees as flying, stinging machines, we need to move away from that and appreciate the huge contribution they make, not only to the food on our plates, but to our entire world. Bees help us, and most everything else, to have food on our tables. In a lot of places in the world today, we are leaving bees a plate with less, a table with less and less food. We can keep bees fed and keep countless other animals fed and keep food on our tables by putting food back on the table for bees. Colleagues and I have been studying bees in North Dakota, in the northern Great Plains, to figure out how they're doing in farmlands and how to support them. We were interested in what's happening in North Dakota because North Dakota traditionally has been a great place for bees. It's one of the top honey-producing states in the entire U.S. One out of every four honeybee colonies in the entire country is brought to North Dakota in the summertime. This is over 600,000 colonies, and each of these colonies has tens of thousands of bees. Honeybees are brought by beekeepers to North Dakota, not only to produce honey, but also so their colonies can grow strong, because these colonies are then brought by beekeepers across the rest of the country to, to pollinate crops that help put food on our tables. North Dakota has also been a great place for other bees. The honeybee, that, while well known by many, is just one of 20,000 different kinds of bees in the world. And North Dakota has been home to over 300 different kinds of bees. These bees aren't managed by people. They're, out, they're living in the wild. They are also very important pollinators of crops and wildflowers. All of these bees, honeybees and wild bees, need food to eat. And all bees get their food from flowers. Wild bees also need a place to live. They all make nests, some in the ground, some are in plant stems. A lot of them are needing areas that are safe from disturbances like mowing or tilling. A lot has changed in the landscape in North Dakota over the last 200 years. Before European settlers were here, it was mostly prairie, which was dominated by native grasses and flowers. The indigenous people here did practice agriculture, but it was on a fairly small scale. There were still many flowers and many places for bees to make nests. Basically, most of North Dakota was great bee habitat. 100 years ago, European settlers had already converted most of that prairie into farmland. 63% of North Dakota was already farmland 100 years ago. A diverse range of crops was grown in these farmlands, many of which were providing food for bees. There were few pesticides being used on these crops. Things were basically still pretty good for bees. The European settlers also brought honeybees with them. Before this time, there were not any honeybees here. Honeybees are not native to North America. The beekeepers, a hundred years ago, were focused mostly on honey production. They weren't bringing their colonies all across the country for pollination. They had smaller local operations. We know something about the wild bees that were here a hundred years ago, thanks to the work of O.A. Stevens. O.A. Stevens was a botanist and a bee researcher that was based at North Dakota State University. And 
he found many different species of bees in North Dakota. An important thing about the collections that he found here for bees is that there were even numbers between the different species of bee. There was no one kind of bee that was dominating the community. You may have heard biologists talking about the importance of biodiversity. When we're talking about diversity, we're talking about that evenness among the species that indicates a stable community. So these diverse communities are telling us that it's a healthier community. One common bee 100 years ago was the yellow-banded bumblebee. This bumblebee and other species of bumblebees are becoming a cause for concern as populations have dropped over recent decades. Bee collections like that of O.A. Stevens are our only window to the past to know what things were like for bees. His collection is currently housed at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. It's thanks to the important work that this museum has done and also the scientists there that have ensured that these specimens are properly identified and databased that give us this information, this window to the past to even know what things were like then so we can see how things have changed. We know that the farmland has changed a lot over the last 100 years in North Dakota. For one thing, there is a lot more of it. Over 90% of the land in North Dakota is now farmland. Bee food is becoming more scarce, and pesticide use is becoming more frequent. Driven by price increases due to their use as biofuels, there's been a dramatic increase in the amount of corn and soy that are being grown in this state. This, but neither soy nor corn provide bees with much food. Things are getting harder for bees. We can see this clearly in what's happening with honeybees. Honeybees are having increased health problems. We know that these problems are due to a combination of different factors. There's interactions between pathogens, parasites, pesticides, and poor nutrition. It's harder for beekeepers to keep honeybee colonies alive from one year to the next. Honeybees are different than other bees in that they're managed, kind of like livestock. So although we are losing honeybee colonies, beekeepers can breed them and create more colonies to replace them. You don't need to worry about the honeybee going extinct. But these current losses are not economically sustainable for the beekeepers. We need these beekeepers to be able to stay in business and have enough colonies to, to bring around to pollinate the crops that we need. Things are getting hard for wild bees, too. We know they're affected by some of the same factors as the honeybees. But for most places, we don't really know what's going on with all these wild bees. This is one of the reasons why I came to North Dakota, because this was one of the places where we, we knew we had information from 100 years ago, but we didn't know what was happening there now. When I first came to North Dakota to start looking for bees, and I saw not many flowers, not many places to nest, I thought that it didn't really look like it would be a great place for bees. I was surprised to find that there are still many wild bees that are using these farmlands. A key difference between what I saw now and what O.A. Stevens saw 100 years ago is that the community of bees is less diverse. Although I found many different species, there were a few species that were dominating the community. <coughs> These species are doing pretty well with scraps of habitat that are left. Other species are not finding what they need, like the yellow-banded bumblebee. A hundred years ago, in the collections of O.A. Stevens, this bee was one out of every 25 bees that he captured. During my recent surveys, one out of every 2,000 bees was a yellow-banded bumblebee. Unlike honeybees, 
When wild bees decline, we don't have the option to breed more. Conservationist Aldo Leopold pointed out one of the many important reasons to preserve biodiversity. To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. We need to preserve these species while they're still here. And the good news is that a lot of these species are still there, but we do need to act quickly as their numbers are drastically lower than what they used to be. We do have options, things we can do, to help keep bees alive and healthy. And this is where we get to also beautify the world around us. Planting flowers is one of the best things we can do. And we need to keep these flowers free of pesticides. This will help not only bees, but it will also help butterflies, frogs, birds. It will help improve our soil and water quality. We can do this. We can all go home and do this in our gardens. We can do this at schools. We can do this at our businesses. And this helps. But if we only do this, we're going to end up with most of these flowers where most people live. And looking at population density in the US, you can see that there's broad areas of the country where there's not so many people. <laughs> To make a bigger impact, we need to also be thinking about putting these flowers where bees need them. That we're, and in our farmlands across the country, these bees are looking at less and less available foods. I'm a bee scientist, and in case you haven't been able to tell, I'm very passionate about what I do. <laughs> Talking with farmers, I know that they're very passionate about what they do, and they know the value of sustainability. They also need to make decisions that are based on economics. They already have so much risk in their businesses. We can't ask them to add more risk to their business plans. Avoiding risk from pest damage is one of the reasons why pesticide use has become so much more common. Farmers need tools to reduce pesticide use. And we do have these that, that we can share more. There are pest monitoring tools. They can have more sustainable choices from agricultural companies. And importantly, have more connections to scientifically-based management decisions. The best solutions for helping bees in our farmlands are going to be to find ways that we can support both the farmers and the bees. My colleagues and I found some things that were in the landscapes in North Dakota that are already supporting bees, and these are things that are already there in the farmland. There are some crops that can feed bees. Some of the common ones are canola, sunflower, and alfalfa. There's also new research that's looking at biofuel crops that can also provide forage for bees, possibly providing alternatives to soy and corn. There are set-aside programs, like the Conservation Reserve Program. These programs economically compensate farmers for setting aside habitat for wildlife. And some of these programs are focused specifically on setting this habitat aside to create food for pollinators. Trees can make a big difference. They're not all that common in North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> Having rows of fields, rows of trees between the fields can help provide nesting for wild bees. If these are planted with trees and shrubs that also flower, they can also provide food for all bees. Enhancements like these that I've been mentioning can be supported by both state and federal programs, and they're shaped by local and federal legislation. One of the biggest players in this is the federal farm bill. 
So it is important for you to plant flowers wherever you can, but let's make sure that this food for bees is getting to where it's needed, which is where bees are, which should be just about everywhere. Make sure that our farm bill has measures that help farmers support bees. Work with local and regional growers, create solutions for pollinators where pollinators live. Keep food on the world's table by making sure we keep food on the table for bees. Thank you.